Hello, greetings everyone. And we're just getting started here. We're, we're live on Facebook and YouTube, hopefully. Do we have any viewers? I don't know, let's find out. Um, let's see, we have 12 viewers. Hi everyone, I am Jason Bosch and this is, if we were honest, um, a new program that I've started. And um, bear with me, I'm, I'm a one-man band here, and I'm kind of trying to do a lot of different things at the same time. And we're going to have Varun here with me. He was with me a minute ago, but um, we lost him, so he should be coming back here in just a minute. So in the meantime, um, I guess I will just uh, chat with you a little bit um, by myself, which is awkward. So if you guys want to um, speak to me through the comment section, either on YouTube or on Facebook, that would be great. Um, and then as the program goes on, if you have questions, we want to kind of make this interactive. And I was working on trying to set up a thing where the, 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 the comments will actually pop up on the screen, kind of like this. Um, I was only able to get the Facebook one to work. So um, anyway... We, so if you make a Facebook comment, I can actually share it with uh, with the live stream. Um, the YouTube, I am still have not been able to get that one to work. But the YouTube stream is live. And um, so I, the, the whole, I'll, I'll just explain while we're waiting for Varun to join us. Um, first of all, can everybody hear me and everybody getting the good quality? You want to make a comment on there about how, how it looks and sounds to give me an idea. Hello, Allison. Hello, Roma. Great to kind of join you join us <laughs> um so so the idea of the show is uh, you know that the title is if we were honest and uh one of the things that i've been frustrated with over the years is uh i think that there's a lack of honesty in our our communications with each other and our and our dialogues with ourselves as well um we we um we're pretty good at deluding ourselves and, you know, a lot of this came from my political work and just realizing that, you know, the avenues that were being offered through the political process or parties or, or you know, this, this candidate's going to come and save us or whatever, um, or the nonprofit world, uh, realizing that those were actually dead ends. And yet we're continuing, to, continuing to, um, uh, oh, great, good sound quality, excellent. Uh, we continue to... Uh, you know, keep doing these same things, even though they're clearly not working and they're actually, you know, putting us backward. Um, so, and so I, anyway, so I was trying to come up with a name for the show. I thought, well, you know, if we were honest, and I say this to myself as well, like if I were honest with myself, you know, what would I do? What would I say? And I was talking to Varun, we had kind of a sample call the other day, uh, where we just chatted and, um, he was talking about um, habits and how your habits make your 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 reality, and there's there's the truth is in your habits. I can actually read what he you know he had made some comments to me, um, and I I came I thought of something that I heard about when what you think and what you say and what you do is all cut from the same cloth, and I really like that idea of like there's a there's a, often a disconnect between our thoughts our words and our actions and to being you know working to get to a point where where all those things are cut from the same cloth um i thought that was a really great um great idea but um so i feel awkward just sitting here talking <laughs> without anyone to interact with so give me just one minute i'm going to uh, jump to this other screen and i'm going to um see if i can't get a varun so just hang tight i'll be right back
and I guess you guys might want to hear what I have to say. All right, here we go. All right, we're so here we are. Varun, can you hear me? Good morning. Hey, yay, we have Varun. Okay, we're we're in business. <laughs> Um, this is a process. Uh, give me one second, and uh, this I'm I'm in the process of doing this. I actually probably should have a um, someone else doing the technical while I try to do the show. <laughs> um, so how are you how are you doing, Varun? I'm going to set up a, a multi screen so they can see both of us. But uh, you want to? Okay. I'm alright. How are you? What's happening? Uh... Ah. Good. So I thought this would just be laid back and um, yeah, okay. just real chill here. Give me one second. Let me uh... okay. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. I'm just sit setting up a multi screen. Reset. Reset. So, one second. Yeah. Are you also on the YouTube live right now? Yeah, we're on uh, YouTube live, and it looks like all the comments okay. are on YouTube. Uh, so we'll have okay. to watch. You, if you want to bring up your I, – I noticed there's a way you can bring up the YouTube, and you can lower the quality of the video to really, really yeah. low. That way it doesn't or, – or you might even be able to stop the video and still get the – let me see if I can stop the video and still make, see the comments. Um, that would be nice. Um, so, oh, is this a mute? Are you live? yeah, so there's a light, there's a slight delay. And one second here, I'm just setting up multi-screen. I had it set up, but then we <coughs> position. Well, I have a multi-screen, but I'm bigger than you, and I don't want to be bigger than you, Varun. There we go. There we go. Okay. All right. Let's try this. Hey, there we we're both we're both in the shot. Oh, yeah. All right. That's a little bit better. How do you guys like that? Okay. Thanks for uh, uh, greetings from Toron Toronto, B Porgy, Amor. Hello, Roma, CV. Thank you guys for joining us. And um, so that this is just going to be a, a conversation, and I might take some clips out of it. And Varun and I actually had a conversation uh, the other day uh, that was really great as well, which I recorded. So I, I might make a, like a compilation from from both of these calls uh, with it. So uh, so w some of the topics of discussion we were we were thinking about doing was just how entertainment and how media actually uh, affects our worldview. And, and shapes our, our perception of the world and, and the, the disconnect of that from, um, from the, the real world. There's, this is, seems to be a theme that comes a lot, a lot with me and others is just what's, what's real and what's fiction. <laughs> and uh, ironically, it, it, I had an interesting conversation with a really good friend. I had lunch with a good friend of mine today, and he's got an interesting worldview. Um, I can't say that I... I think there's some some validity in some of the stuff he says, but some of the stuff he says I, I I'm not completely aligned with. But he you know he kind of is one of the believers that you you shape your reality through your through through your you know what you believe, and um, you know the challenge I have with that is is of course the, the, the it almost kind of places blame on on people in the world who are suffering like they just don't have a positive enough, enough outlook or whatever, but. Um, but I certainly do believe that our thoughts and beliefs do um, affect our behaviors and how we interact with one another. And but 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 this larger question of of you know what's happening around the world with war and what with you know people living in poverty and and now with what's happening with 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 the Great Reset and the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Um, you know that there are these these there are these outside forces that are going to have major influence on on us individually and us collectively and um you know where do we go from here how do we deal with this um i'm kind of rambling but varun do you want to kind of 
start us off with with some thoughts on on some of the you had sent me an email and I was mentioning it before you came on here about um, some of the ideas around uh, your habits, um, your personal life versus your professional life. And we could actually, there's a lot we could talk about there. Um, how there's like a disconnect. There was a, there was a, um, an essay that I read called The Hitman's Dilemma years ago. And I thought it was pretty fascinating because he was talking about this idea of um, – business and personal being this these two separate worlds there and there's a wall between them and he talks about how like someone does something really shitty in business and they say hey it's not it's not personal it's it's business and somehow that makes it okay and he gives the example of like the the moff the gangster movies where he says it's not personal it's business and he shoots the guy in the head well that's a very that's very personal and what business does isn't personal so we talked about you know you you thought that that would be a good topic of discussion the personal versus professional life um the reposition uh repression of true identity uh which is which in fact does need rectification but this is usually institutionalized, and these are this is what you had written me, Varun, uh-huh. primarily through education, rule following, rather than addressing the contents of the psyche and tuning them. We are made to repress them, either with the reward system or through punishment. And that's a whole another great topic, reward and punishment. There's a guy named Alfie <coughs> Cohn that I've always been, um, that I've, I've, I've read of and, and, and watched some of his lectures. Um, he's an educator and he talks about the problems with using punishment and reward uh, as both being problematic in, in raising your children. So he's a, he's a child development and educator type fellow, but he was saying that, you know, using reward is also just as damaging as for using punishment because you're basically teaching people to do the things to do, to do things for the wrong reasons because you're trying to gain reward or, avoid punishment yeah. and so obviously we want a culture where you know we have good citizens or you know fellow people whatever um where you know people are acting in good faith you know not out of some sort of um gaming sort of mechanism so and then uh, the angle of authentic authenticity versus creative created personas and I thought a lot about this, which is, you know, people talk about human nature. What is human nature? Um, you know, I don't know what human nature is because we don't have a um, a control group, right? We're we're all parts of our we're parts of cultural systems. We're parts of economic systems, social systems. Um, you know, I don't know what we you know what we are like. Are there is is there's an essence to us that's that that's you know, it sounds like you're expressing there might be like some sort of this this is your true self versus this is self that's imposed on us. Um, it's an interesting question. I don't know what the answer to that is. I mean, I do feel like I have an identity that has been with me since I was very small. Like, I don't remember, like, I, I, I'm, I've changed a lot, but I'm still the same person. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. So that's there's a lot there to throw out there, but do you want to... Um, do you want to take it from there, Varun? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think let's start with how, uh, what you were talking about earlier, which was uh, how our beliefs create the world. I think you use this kind of very new agey idea of uh, <clears throat> how we think and feel and our personal realities as a separate thing. That I think that the this movement of manifesting our realities, which I think started even as early as, early as the 60s from now, but <clears throat> it has managed to disconnect people from the rest of society, you know, like in the sense that now it's centered on manifesting something that I want physically or as a partner or, you know, you want a new job or a car or more money or whatever, these kind of things. But the understanding within that kind of thinking is that some higher power is doing it. Your higher self is doing it or God is doing it or the universe is doing it. But if, if I mean, I look at it very practically, right? Like, I mean, I, I want a laptop or a new mobile phone or a bike or a car or a bicycle, whatever. 
unless other humans have made it somewhere else, no matter how much synchronicity there is in the universe, it doesn't make itself present in my life. So in that sense, what we are trying to do is command human labor in our personal favor, which is essentially exactly how the industrial model functions in the sense that I am an isolated object that needs to be validated. I mean, the existence of this thing that is alive needs to be validated on multiple different levels at different stages in life so that it can then enter society as a functional object, which is productive and and in the sense like it has to go through first it gets taught a family value system then there is the institutionalizing of that thing that is alive which is which i can call i or me where then i mean like we were saying before is that the the reward and the punishment system comes in so we are taught at a very early age what is okay and what is not. And our cognitive map is basically put into a very, very strict line of thinking, which is that I have to earn a certain kind of grade so that I'm then able to go to college and then higher education and then get a job and then get the life that I want. Right. So the ownership of the life that I'm living is not with me from the very beginning and to notice that much later in the years it's a it's a very difficult thing I think because then there has to be a, a falling away of all of these rules and reward systems that we've been taught on how to live in society and I think that's we get industrialized at a very young age and like we were talking in the previous conversation also is that we end up working largely for other people's dreams, right? Like, so let's say that I launch a company today, which is um, selling shoes and I'm going to advertise on social media as taking part in some kind of character building for the public, right? So I'm, I'm hitting some kind of subconscious emotional notes so that people resonate with the object. But ultimately, I'm making money from it, right? Like so, then people fall into this trap of aspirational marketing, which is uh, which is far away from how actually things are functioning. You know? Like that's that's the persona that gets created is that this falsehood of who I am in the world versus who I am at home are two now separate things. So this bipolarity is is what industrial society is. That's the hyper reality that we function with within society there's no I mean the more sincere and authentic you are the the more danger there is of being ostracized because everybody expects a, a mask everybody is expecting a sense of industrial propriety which is not necessarily authentic so we're taught how to get along but the repression of what is called the shadow or the, the uglier sides of our identities, which is violence, or it could be jealousy, or whatever. I mean, I mean, they've been talked about in all kinds of belief systems, but all of those things are present in all of us, and as a group, as a as a unity, when these things are repressed in one part of the world, they necessarily need to be resolved in in some way, so they show up in other parts of the world, and then now we're looking at the, I mean, largely the, the shadow of the world is, has risen and we are all dealing with it. So, yeah, I mean, those are some, those are some basic thoughts on that. Yeah. How does that, do you think that plays with the idea? I've always thought a lot about the idea of schizophrenia and, and people that are like supposedly mentally ill, which I mean, obviously they're not aligned, but there's, I don't view mental illness in the same way that, you know, like the medical establishment views it as, you know, I always like the, the quote, I don't know who said it first. I know it's been attributed to Krishnamurti and all sorts of different people, but the idea of like, um, you know, living, 
you know, being being healthy in an unhealthy world or being sane in, in an insane world, that, that kind of concept, or Martin Luther King said, you know, being mal, mal talked about being maladjusted. Um, and that, that, that there's something about our society that, that forces us into this duality of, of, you know, you've got to perform a certain way and act a certain way for your, for your paycheck. And I noticed that a lot of the people that I really um, connect with and the people that are just truth tellers are kind of, you know, the, the people that are like, damn the torpedoes, they, they just speak their truth and it co it costs them, you know, um, but like myself, like I don't have, like I don't work for a big corporation. I don't, I'm not, I'm not like connected with any institution, or I'm not connected to any political political party or anything like that. And I, um, the the, it makes it more difficult to 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 operate just as a lone person, you know, in terms of you know having an effect. But it's but it also gives you a freedom to you know be more genuine and, and speak more truthfully to to your own truth that's not not to say that i have the truth i'm not saying that that i do but um i don't know there's well, if, it, if we go if we go one step further than that i think that i mean we don't i think we like thoughts exist all thoughts exist in that sense right like and we make a selection out of what kind of thinking we want to do I think that's a subconscious process. I think, I mean, because of how we feel in certain situations, we understand that that kind of thinking is what, what the kind of exposure we have in life and the kind of experiences that we have, that kind of fine tunes and what kind of thinking process we would like to have. And then, I mean, all thoughts are possible, generally speaking, right? Like, I mean, thoughts exist in the world and we, we are part of that world. So we, 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 we assign ourselves a certain kind of emotionality and a certain kind of thinking process and then everything else is then it remains outside so i mean we find that very obvious <clears throat> very obviously in the left and the right argument in politics right is that that i don't think like this but you do so this division like you you mentioned krishnamurti you know, he has written very extensively about the split like the immediate split that happens in the othering and how you how you relate, like how you, how you cease to relate with the world is by confining how you are thinking and what your emotions are. Because I think that the fear of annihilation is it largely stems from the ego, not not necessarily from the idea of physical mortality. So when the ego wants to preserve itself, then it wants to hold on to a certain set of ideals, whether it's mental or emotional and then function from that so that it can outlast what it thinks might be its end. I think that's how it functions. But I mean, this image that we form of ourselves versus the image that other people have of us are largely irreconcilable. I think that's, I mean, Krishnamurti has talked a lot about that actually, but <clears throat> that's one thing that that, that collision is uh, to, to re get rid of the filter to be able to understand another perspective is um, is a difficult task. I think it's a, it's not an easy thing. Um, but I think that thought and emotion is collaborative. I think it's it's a that I mean you and I can go and sit in separate caves in the world, you know, and think about enlightenment and all of those things, but that doesn't really change how society at large functions. So when we are in society and we understand how collaborative it actually is and how we are very much part of the movement of the entire unit, I think that then begins to shift also the power dynamic in, in, in general. And real quick, for those who are watching, um, if you, I'd like to read your comments, but if you make comments on like, if you shared the video and then, and then there's a, like, it creates a new post and then people start commenting on that post, I'm not going to be able to see all of that. So if you want to make a comment that, that, that both Varun and I can see and, um, 
go to the I, I created a page where this video is, is posted on Facebook and it's it's the if we were honest page and if you you make a comment on the original video on that page that's live I'll be able to that I'm monitoring that and then also the YouTube link as well I, I'm also monitoring that so if, if anybody wants to chime in chime in um, I will if you have questions or whatever I will repeat them uh, or if you have some comment that I that you want to make unfortunately I can't feed in the YouTube one but if you make one on the Facebook one I can actually pop it on the screen which is uh, kind of magical um, so anyways I wanted to say that and then another thing I wanted to say about this um, idea of, of the other uh, as, as particularly as it pertains to um, the politics uh, is that I noticed and I noticed this many years ago that people on the so-called left um, learn about what the people on the right think from say like MSNBC or or their progressive media pundits they're not actually finding out what people I believe by having most I mean they do have some real conversations but they're not I wouldn't even I would argue they're not even real conversations because it's basically just people repeating uh repeating these 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 like taglines or you know scripts scripts Basically. that they've heard you, yeah. you, it, t it takes a little bit of work but i because i've had conversations with people who disagree with me politically and i've noticed it takes a lot of work to actually dig 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 under all that crap and and actually get to how they really feel and and you know you could you can go off on some tangent and then start arguing about a fact whether something is true or not and i and i think there's a million of those that i think they're deliberately set up like roadblocks to prevent conversation. So same thing, people on the right learn about what the people on the left th believe, not from actually having conversations, like real conversations with people on the left. Um, and that I, you know, I think that that's such a huge problem it, that there's just this lack of, of discourse. And especially now there's like, there's, there's like a, a separation that's happening that is preventing like, conversation and i've always said like as much as you can't stand these the people who are your political you, you know your political opposition they're not going anywhere they're here and i think there's a lot of work that needs to happen to to bring people you know unless you plan on going to war with them and taking up arms and i you know i i don't see that as that is a a a, a a winning strategy and it's one that appears to serve the people in power over and over again so um that was one thing that came to mind well, when you were when you were talking so <clears throat> there was a, this uh, example that I, I usually like very much is that let's say that two groups of people go to different rallies political rallies for their own ideologies or maybe there are five right in the current system the way it's set up they all probably have the same phones. They're buying all of their clothes at the same stores. They're buying the food at the same places. The point of access of <clears throat> everyday living is exactly the same. And for me, that's a funny thing is that everybody wants similar things in life. You know? Like everybody wants to feel intimate. They want affection, love, security, but how they want it is how political ideology is functioning. It's kind of appropriated thinking where this is the right way to live versus that is the right way to live. But how we are actually living is exactly the same. It's exactly the same. Like people buy the same cars, they'll buy the same clothes, they buy the same, I mean, they'll go to the same stores to buy all the same stuff. So like lived life is very different from what political leanings I might have or what philosophy I have of life. It's it has, it has very little to do with how the world is actually functioning, in my opinion. I mean, and the world is functioning very much on our everyday silent habits. That's, yeah, that's how I think. And the lived life is interesting because as as we're as we move more into these digital spaces, which can be manipulated like incredibly. Uh, you know, the, sh the shaping of your reality. I mean, it, it goes back to even just, you know, watching a film or something, you know, there's, there's, there's a, there's an editing process and there's, there's a process that went on to, um, you know, as art, it can be really great. But when you start to view the world, when you watch television or, 
you know, you you listen to the radio and you're you 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 think this is the real world, and 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 it's not. It, it's really not. And, and so in terms of perception and belief, you know, I've just, it's, to me, it's been a slow process of me just kind of tuning. It's the old, you know, the 60s, 60s thing, which, you know, I tune out or whatever. But, uh, you know, it really is like that really is we do need to tune out to it. We need to like recognize that there, the manipulation that's going on and the deception that goes on in the media is just off the charts. And so like, I, I'm I'm actually to the point which I don't want to be judgmental or anything, but like I'm I'm astonished that people still will believe a politician, you know, who has this like l- a whole lifetime of being a you know a lying sack of shit. I'm sorry, you know, I don't, and I'm talking whether it's Joe Biden or Donald Trump. Yeah. I mean, both of yeah. these guys are scumbags, complete scumbags, yeah. and um, and yet people are like. Well, maybe we could push him to the right, or maybe he, you know, or whether you're you know, Trump supporters, maybe he's secretly behind the scenes working to to save children or some shit, you know. And it's just like, I, I, it, I the 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 perception, you know, does kind of make your, it does it, it it certainly influences reality, but it's not reality. Your your you know your, the your belief in in these people does not make them good people, you know. And uh, yeah, well, it's it's kind of astonishing that 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 after all that's come out, that people still have any hold any you know value in what any of these politicians say, or these bureaucrats, or you know these media people who are you know. It's not an attack on them personally. It's just business. No, <laughs> but um, yeah. you know, I don't know. Thoughts on that. Well, I mean, uh, I think we were speaking about this briefly the last time we spoke. But when there is, like, at, I remember I was young, well, in the eight, eight, late 80s, early 90s, when the um, the first Gulf War was being televised. And there was already a debate whether showing so much violence and death on mainstream TV was okay. There was ethical discussions in all kinds of uh, publications and TV news channels, at least in India. But when you have that kind of a situation that is continuously being streamed, and then you have a perpetual stream of different sorts of violence in different sorts of places, then all I guess the audience is now starting to feel that the world is a threatening place. So we've, we've already created this atmosphere where the outside world is out of control and as a unit or as an individual as a family unit or as an individual I can't do anything about this so the military industrial complex has to sort this out and so when there is a leader that starts speaking saying that I will stop the war then of course people are saying yeah okay so we got to go work for this guy or that good woman or whatever you know so the, this kind of and now I mean I mean look let's look at it from that angle and then you have a uh, uh, market system that is entirely built on obsolescence and indulgence. So you're living in a perpetually threatening world where you can go to the market and satiate your fear and your needs, needs and indulgences simultaneously. And then on top of that, you have now like threats of biosecurity like right now, which is that now you're also scared of other people walking in the street. Earlier, that was not the case. Your little bubble has, like our little bubbles have shrunk in size in that sense. Now, my survival instinct is even more heightened, but I'm still going to look for an authority figure that is going to be able to keep my life safe. And I have no control over it anymore. So, I mean, yeah, these, um, I think these are really hopeless arguments that some politician or bureaucrat is going to sort our lives out for us. I think it's time also to kind of access all of this from a different perspective, which is to say that <clears throat> without our movement and everyday living, none of the world is possible. None of its movement is possible. We cannot hold ourselves outside of the world anymore. I think that time is gone. I think we have to understand how much our life actually is intertwined with other 
human beings and as a unit of all human beings with the habitat. We can't wait for some NGO or some politician to sort out the climate crisis or or stop the wars for us. And I mean, there are ways to do that. If we chart our everyday living, there are ways to make the connections to see how much we are part of it. And it's not a, it's not an easy to 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 I think to uncover maybe and also to accept. I think the acceptance that I might be also the reason that I mean I might be part of the reason that there is trouble in heaven, so to speak, is not an easy easy thing because we have, like when you get when when we get given a clean shit from the institutionalized learning system then we step into the world as being on the right path so being wrong as living having lived a wrong wrong, wrong life where that the blame even part of the blame not like all of the part of the blame also rests with me is not an easy thing to accept i think that's a very difficult psychological it sh it shakes the found very foundations of how i function in society you know because i'd like to believe that i'm a good person and i don't harm people but as an extension ev my everyday consumption is directly related to humanitarian crisis right like i don't know where all the all the metals and the and the minerals that go into making my my mobile phone where do they come from? Like I mean, nobody has the time to go and research this. But if you did, the, I mean, if somebody did, but then you see that this every one year or one and a half years that I go and buy a new phone, how that ties into the industrial system like that. It's immediate. Like there's, you know, like so. It, those are very. I think that's a very difficult negotiation for individuals to make in general because we re tend to rely more on or well, at least in like in the last five ten years the argument has become that liberal economics and the politi politicians associated with that are going to be able to give us the same life but with less detriment and i don't think that is possible at all mm. when there's there's a couple things about what you just said there in terms of like these these different competing you know they're they're, they're presented as competing um I guess value systems and and two big ones that I that I notice come up a lot of times are um, the individual. You know, America is all about the individual um, versus the collective, and uh, and I think that's a really important thing to kind of pick apart. Which is, um, I come at this from a standpoint of I I think that that both I see that both things are really important. You know, you can't just sacrifice the individual for the collective. And then who, who does that? Who, who has the choice to make that? Um, you know, yeah. I have, I'm very like, I mean, capital, I'm an anti-capitalist, like kind of libertarian, if that makes any sense. It doesn't make any sense because of the, the, we don't have a language. But, um, but I think that coming up with a, a, a conversation that respects both the, the collective and our responsibility to one another, and our and our respond and our connection to one another, as well as our individuality, and it's always presented in these two different models, which with ironically both involve either state or corporate power, uh, and so that yeah. that 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 what should be a really personal conversation uh, and a community conversation um, ends up being put into these these containers that involve oh well do you support you know. Russian style state communism or do you to support American style laissez faire capitalism? And I think that that's just it's I think it's a it's it's a bad faith it's it's a bad way of presenting the it it, it excludes the conversation that I think really needs to happen. Yeah, and also I I mean let's look at it. Like what is the individual? No, I mean in the sense like what how how is the psyche of the individual built? Like what is it full of? It's full of the world, right? In that sense, like I'm thinking only in the world. It's not like I'm thinking in some other. I mean, the paradigms are they belong to all the people in this world right now, right? Like so, I'm in that sense, in some way, a sum, as a chosen sum. Like I can make those choices now because I'm half conscious, maybe, maybe, but I can say that. Then, like what? How you were saying is that 
how do we negotiate the role of the or, or the role of the individual and the group like how does the individual fit into the group right so in the sense that i think at this time it's necessary for the individual to be recontextualized within the gambit of nature and then the question of existence itself at the moment the individual is only contextualized in industrial society as a as a productive unit of the supply chain where it goes and does a job and earns the money and then goes and spends the money you know like that's the that's the only trajectory that and then people say that this is how life is you know and then and i am kind of helpless to say that i can i can resolve the problems of the world but unless we are able to take responsibility for the group as individuals i think that's where that that gap is right like how do i take responsibility for the group what are the things that i can do in my personal life as an individual that will then reflect into the larger picture but it doesn't take like i was saying before it doesn't take i mean we can't resign from this like i can or i'll happily go and sit in a cave but that doesn't solve the problems of the world right because everybody has to do it together at least in small steps incrementally not a, like i mean we always keep expecting i think that the revolution will happen in an instant but i think it's it's going to be smaller steps where we start understanding how our internal life plays out in larger systems and how the systems that we as a group have invented to organize ourselves are no longer working in our favor and we have to reinvent them and we have to understand how that how that fractal actually functions what is the what is the similarity between me and the systems that i have or that we have we have created to to manage ourselves and that um brings me into you know kind of one of the the main topics that i wanted to to discuss here was just how the role of art and and entertainment and media you know shapes our world view and shapes our view of ourselves and each other and the and the planet and um in terms of art and its role in you know you said we have to create something new um in order to do that we have to first imagine it and there was a really great book yeah. that i read years ago by uh it was it was by uh, an educator by the name of maxine green g-r-e-e-n-e -E -E. and the the book was essays uh it's called releasing the imagination essays on art imagination and social change and she was basically just arguing because the schools were kind of cutting back and always have been cutting back on the arts and what they consider like extracurricular and she was arguing that the arts are like critical for our growth as human beings. And it's actually critical for our, our ability to create change because you know, you're, you're in the system, you go out there every day and this is how things are and you're stuck in that. Right. But you have to like, well, what if this, well, what if we did this differently or what if we thought differently or what if, you know what I mean? Like, and, and she was saying that it's, it's the arts that, that uh, like exercise that part of your brain to imagine another reality that then you can, you know, uh, you have, then you have, then we have to do the work to create that reality. Um, you know, I don't think just imagining yeah. it is, is, is enough, but, um, but here we are, we have our, our, the, the media that we consume, uh, whether it's film or television or, you know, the arts are, are largely like controlled by these corporations who and and even like in hollywood they have the cia and the pentagon have like offices in hollywood to help guide shape yep. you know scripts and and the pentagon gives you know helps with um budgets and helps give military uh gear and, and like jets and stuff to your movie as long as you you know play by their you know let them approve their scripts and whatnot and i've even heard stories yeah. of like the cia like cia people like hanging out at parties and like planting story ideas to like the writers of simpsons or whatever you know and it's like in, which make which makes sense because you look at some of these programs and you're like wait a minute it's that crazy. was that yeah, was crazy. crazy that was some of the like foreshadowing yeah. <laughs> is pretty bizarre but um yeah. But I, I would love to talk a little bit about that. Um, just the idea that 
you know, the, the, the role of, of art and the role of storytelling in society and how important that is and how that's been taken over. And even the people that participate in it, it's not that they are doing it on their own agency, but they, they require money. And so, you know, you, you, over time, you, you know, you can be, I'm an, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker and I'm going to make my film the way I want it. And, and, you know, anybody that, that works in, in the business knows that, that that only lasts for so long. You know, there's yep. only so many David Lynch's out there that can that have the capital to do that, you know. Um, yep. So do you want to do you want to, to to say something about that? Well, sure. I mean, look at the franchises that are the recent ones, which is uh, the Batman trilogy and the Avengers series, where it's so blatant that the military, military industrial complex is saving us, right? Like it's the rich billionaire kind of playboy image, which is the, the savior. <laughs> the, the dissidents are always um, people who don't believe in money so much and they understand the power structure, which they are trying to disrupt, but they are always the villains. So that kind of storytelling, it kind of legitimizes how the power structure is set up right now. And uh, the common man is only as good as making a small decision, but the saving of the planet and humanity is going to be left to the big boys, basically. I mean, that, and that kind of narrative creation, I mean, look at the amount of audiences and the kind of traction that these kind of ideas actually get, you know, like they're, they convince people that unless you are in some way, I mean, first of all, they kind of validate revalidate the idea that there has to be another hero, right? Like there has to be a hero, first of all. And you take away from everybody's internal hero's journey in that sense, right? Um, and when you do, like there's a disconnect from the internal life that the, like the psyche is going through this metamorphosis, which we are not allowed to really look at. It's appropriated and it's played on the screen and it's in somebody else's control. So you don't have to worry about it. You know, like it's that kind of thing. I mean, like we were, I think we were briefly discussing this is that there was a big series, Game of Thrones, in which one of the lead characters is murdered by a group of people. And thousands, if not millions of people were doing these reaction videos, crying for a fictional character in a TV series. But at the same time, the migration crisis was happening from Africa into Europe. And I mean, I didn't see even one. I mean, it was on the news, but I didn't see a single reaction video from the public about a real issue of the world. And that for me is very telling. It's a very big sign that the emotionality that we have and the, the sentimentality maybe also and the thinking that we have has been, because the violence and the destruction is so overwhelming, that we'd, we'd shut our eyes, we'd rather shut our eyes from the real world and empathize more with the fiction world where we can actually vent our emotions, where the relatability is much easier. We see, I mean, those emotions are in all of us, but the point of contact with the outside world is only fiction. There is no real contact with the world. So in that sense, fiction worlds, and of course, I mean, news is also for me now fiction completely, but these are worlds that can, that have managed to create what um, some of the situationists have called the, the, the spectacle, which is the hyper reality. And so we, it's kind of self-referential and slowly behind this, this screen, the world is struggling with itself and we are not allowed to see it in some way. We are allowed to, well, we have to be perpetually, like, in, like somebody mentioned, I think, in one of the comments on the Century of the Self, but it's like happy, happiness making machines. I think it was in Century of the Self. So that's, yeah, it's a very neurotic kind of turn that we have taken in the sense that they, like, I mean, in short, empathy has been kind of appropriated by this veneer, the fiction, and the reality of the world is still as destructive and violent and as horrific as it has been. Yeah, you mentioned um, The Century of the Self, which is a fantastic film by, uh, it's a four part series by Adam Curtis. Anybody who's watching yeah. this, if you haven't seen it, it's on YouTube. It's uh, 
worth watching. It's really phenomenal. It's called The Century of the Self. Um, but and it's it's interesting. You mentioned Batman and and a lot of these characters, and we talked about this the other day. You know how the the the, the hero is like this really wealthy person always. Um, you know, Tony Stark is is the and, and Batman. They're they're wealthy industrialists who fight crime. Uh, you know, by night. And I, I always thought a lot about Batman and how, you know, here he has this really rich guy. And he's he's mostly like, you know, a lot of times he's going after like street thugs, right? <laughs> he's not going after corporate yeah. criminals or, you know. Yeah. Um, and and uh, we, we we mentioned, I'll, I'll, I'll just mention it again, but like the film, you know, a lot of the Marvel films I just find really disturbing in terms of um, the 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 way that they the, the way that they present the stories we, we talked about one about the the, the deaths you know that, that you can just kill people right and left and it's not even a big deal and I I brought up how Kurosawa one of my favorite directors of all time is Akira Kurosawa and his his movies are very violent very graphic but he always showed you the humanity of people and it was never just like this random like for you know these people are just it, it, there was a, there was a deeper human experience and the human story uh involved in it and i think there was there in all his films there was a deep humanity and compassion and love for humanity and and you just don't see that as much in a lot of these films and and they're and they're either like cynical or they're just like uh you know action-packed blowing blow them up but i the the one film that i really you know kind of rail on a little bit is is the film black panther because a lot of my friends who were um activists you know love this film movie they're like you know yes they're you know black power and and you know a, you know africa rising and and all this but but if you actually like pick apart that movie what you realize is you have like a king and it's about extraction and it's but it's just about like bringing bringing more money back to the to the to the people supposedly you know of course we know how real African kings uh, who, who are typically installed um, actually what they actually do in the real, in the real world with the, with the money that they receive uh, usually through loans that, that, uh, that then the people have to pay back or, you know, they push austerity, but, um, and then, and then in the film, there's this, the CIA guys tagging along and he's like the helper. Yeah. He's like, I'm trying to help you guys. I mean, it, it's 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 totally crazy. And I I watch this movie. And I'm like, what the hell is this? And then I and then I saw I saw people posting on online how much they loved it. People I thought were like more hip to like the CIA and like the history of what you know what's going on. So yeah. it's it's pretty bizarre, you know. Uh, but it's powerful. Like the story, st you know, storytelling is so powerful, and it's hard to see. Sometimes you see the story, but you don't see the repeated storylines that that happen over again. Because like the best propaganda yeah. is, uh, I, I posted yeah, a quote from George W. Bush, which is one of my favorite quotes. Which in my line of work, you got to keep repeating things over and over <laughs> to get the truth across, <laughs> to kind of catapult the propaganda. <laughs> So like that's an actual <laughs> quote by Bush, but it is like well, you, you you see these yeah. these these storylines that are repeated, and th they're the, those are the ones you really got to pay attention to when you know it's not just like this one standalone movie when you you hear these same narratives, uh, you know the same outcomes like oh you know the poor guy you know makes good by getting rich, you know and that's the that's the story. Um, I'm curious, what were your thoughts on Slumdog Millionaire? What would you, what did you think about that movie? And what did people in, in India generally, I mean, that's a broad thing, but like. Well, I think, I mean, people in India generally loved the film. Yeah, I mean, also, I mean, there was, I mean, two camps, of course, right? Like, but he managed somehow to get the essence uh of what a Bollywood film should be, and he kind of made it like that, like the lone hero. Um, but for me, that I mean, yeah, I mean, it was a it was a good effort. It's not. I mean, I don't think it was worth the. It was worth the. The publicity that it got. But it was a good film, sure. But in terms of like how fiction and pulp fiction should work, it had a, it had an okay narrative. But there's, so I was talking to somebody else last night, is that there's, and what you brought up, uh, which is this, the subtext 
which is essentially the narrative which is repeated, which is always the same. You there's always the recontextualizing of that narrative, but the narrative always remains the same. Is that there is the authority and they will do the work and the rest of the janta, the public is at their behest and is living through them, which is slightly different in Slumdog Millionaire because this, this young chap without education and experience who's the hero of the film. But yeah, I mean, the I, <clears throat> Danny Boyle is also a very interesting character. <laughs> but, I mean, the I is a very, like the I is very different, right? Like from these spectacular Hollywood productions to like indie cinema that's coming out of smaller regions, maybe even Iran and Africa. The, the way the, the context of narrative is very different because the, the humanitarian aspect of, well, the human aspect of storytelling versus the manipulated aspect of script writing is quite clear to see in that sense. It's, I'll think of some examples right now, but like Abbas Kiorostami or Majid Majidi or Jafar Panahi, these people have written in Iran some very interesting cinema. And of course, they've made, especially Majid Majidi, he's been able to make some political statements, but Kiorostami makes very human statements. And there's this ultimate relatability to what the mystics generally have called the divine. Right? Like, so there's always this kind of small door out leading out, which is like the Truman Show. Like you have, you reach the door at the end of the show, basically. But now, like, I mean, maybe we can go back to how narratives are built and how, why it's easy for the public to follow the narrative. Maybe that's, that, that, that I think is a good, good question to ask is that if we know that there is manipulative narrative behind all the big blockbusters, then why is it that it works? How does it work? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm not really in a good position to answer it because quite frankly, I find most of the movies just like that come out just completely horrific. I, I, I don't even, I don't have the patience to watch. I mean, my uh, five friends would be like, they want to go see some action movie. I'm like, Oh, I just, I can't do it. Yeah. But I'm sure like, you know, I'm sure the movies that I <laughs> enjoy, like, you know, they're not everybody's cup of tea either. But are there particular, you mentioned Kiristami and, and um, there's there's a lot of really amazing filmmakers out there that, you know, aren't as mainstream that, that are really, you know, challenging, like, uh, our beliefs and the, our worldviews and, and, and some of the narratives that are being put out there. Are there some filmmakers that, that you that you really uh, appreciate and some films that, that you like? Um, well, I mean, for sure, Kiorastami for sure. There's a film called The Wind Will Carry Us, which is astounding for me. It's the simplicity in the... And then there's also another film called The Taste of Cherry. These two films are... Very, I mean, one of them, both of them actually are looking at the idea of death and dying and the practicality of it. It's really, it's, it's a beautifully done narrative. I mean, they're both very beautifully done narrative. And then I'm, I tend to, uh, like the two other films, which are also big films and they've come out of Hollywood. One is um, The Tree of Life. And a lot of people really don't like it when I bring this film up because they feel like it's a, um, it's too self-indulgent. But for me, Tree of Life was a. It's. I mean, it might. It might be coming from the angle of Christianity, and talking to God, so to speak. But it also. It's one of the few films that has, able that's been able to kind of. Disembody the soul. Right, it takes the it takes the individual into the universe, right? So the individual is continuously talking with the something or the nothing. You know, like this echo chamber of the universe is very present in that, which I thought was quite interesting. Which is then juxtaposed against the ego-driven male persona of Brad Pitt, 
you know like those are very interesting aspects that i thought about it and the other one was the um samsara which was mark magetson and ron frick mm -hmm. which takes the the buddhist idea of us creating reality and destroying it it was so you begin like the bit the, the film begins with the divine doing the dance and then the human aspect of it creating the physical reality with the wisdom and then by the end like you go through this entire cycle of what society is and then it, the, the the same lamas the monks that were building the, the mandala on the floor they destroy it so it's a very that was quite poetic I thought. yeah so the, so the, yeah yeah, uh, Terrence Terrence Malick. Uh, it's not a, he's not everyone's cup of tea, but uh, I really appreciate yeah. his films. Have you seen Cu uh, Cup of Nights? No, I haven't. Uh, is, no, is, no, is, no, 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 no. is it Night of Cups? Is it Cup of Nights? Night of Cups. Night yeah, of that, cups. that's right. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. another interest, interesting film, huh? Christian, Christian Bale. Bale yeah. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. It was kind of. It didn't really like. It. I don't even. I didn't even see it in the theaters. It just kind of like slipped under the the yeah. rug there i don't know what happened there but um but yeah it, there's i have an appreciation for him a lot i want to bring it back to um the kind of what a lot of this show has been about i mean the reason why i started this show was just because of the crisis that we're facing right now with um you know the great reset the the fourth industrial revolution this 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 global shift from everything yeah. from our finance to our education to our health care to um what it means to be human <laughs> yeah. um yeah. and you know maybe we can lock a little bit you know if you go on netflix there's a ton of shows and even amazon there's a ton of shows about human interaction with uh with robots with ai and from varying different angles and and um and it, it there does seem to be uh a, like a, a foreshadowing or a, a kind of like pushing um, this 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 new this new system kind of subtly through entertainment, like normalizing it, and um, without yeah. any like without any real debate, it's not a matter of like, hey, should we or should we? There's a, there's a few things out there that that I think question it, but uh, you know, a lot of it just is like, hey, this is the future. Uh, and and that idea, like that, the belief that this is the future, is obviously going to help manifest it as as the future, as as a, as an inevitability. And then, of course, there's a if I don't know if anybody's watching has seen that there's a there's a new movie coming out called I think it's Snowbird. Is that right, Snowbird? Have you seen the trailer for this thing? Snowbird, well, yeah, I saw, I saw the trailer. Yeah. It's from the the producers of The Purge, and um, I can't remember the yeah. other, but but it's uh it's really disturbing. You know, it's like this militarized dystopian future that's built around biosecurity. Um, I, I don't, I still don't think it's quite as scary as uh, the work that Allison McDowell is doing. <laughs> it's show, <laughs> but. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this stuff's happening. So, yeah. do, do, do have you had any thoughts about any of the newer stuff that's coming out uh, as it relates to, you know, these changes that we're seeing happen? Like, well, in the, it's interesting to see that, you know, the first Blade Runner film, where the artificial artificial intelligence is a threat and is neutralized by the end of the film, no matter how much how much it believes that it is human right and slowly then in the more recent science fiction films which have to do with a lot of this stuff you see this real rise in how um like films like ex machina or series like westworld where ai wins in the third act it comes out on top it's the thing that is now um more human than human in, in some ways and then you think about things like altered carbon where there is this hyper reality of man and machine and consciousness is disembodied and you can bring it back into another sleeve or some some sort of crazy absolutely crazy stuff but behind all of that behind this narrative creation of ai and the permanence of existence is some kind of 
I don't know what it is, but I mean, for, for me, it just looks like that I don't want this to end. Well, I don't know what this is, but I don't want it to end. So I'll keep doing whatever it is necessary to perpetuate my existence. And then I, I introduce artificial intelligence to make, sh make that possible in some way or the other. I mean, it all, I mean, those narratives are like science fiction. Like I think Alison was saying this, that we need more science fiction writers, <laughs> but to, to be able to write, um, a different kind of narrative, which is not pegging technology as the savior. You know? well, right now, that's how it's being pegged continuously. So I'm trying to go through the, the comments here and trying to add them. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. I still I haven't been able to connect it to the, the live streaming that's happening on YouTube. Maybe the next time I do this, I'll have that part worked out. Um, yeah. And I'm doing this manually too, but um, some people have made some comments about uh, that, so I'm just throwing them up on the screen. Um, but yeah, the the AI thing is is interesting. The and and I I, I was fidgeting over here with with the comments, so I didn't totally catch everything you said. But um, yeah, no but I think uh, I was also rambling on. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, that, um, so. Another thing, like there, there were some weird movies that came out on Netflix recently. There was one where, like, everyone had to be silent. Everybody, you know, if, if you if you talk, you, you have to, you know, you have to be silent, or the or the thing's going to come and get you. There's been a couple of movies that have come out about this with this narrative of keep your mouth shut, or the monster's going to get you. And and I thought that was kind of an interesting theme that I I yeah. don't think is is un, is is an accident. <laughs> Yeah, I don't have sure. you seen what what film? What films were there was one to? called The Quiet Place, and then there was another one uh, with um. Oh, and if anybody's watch, if, if anybody knows what there was one particular one that came out that was really creepy on Netflix, and it had uh, oh I can't even think of her name, but the woman Sandra Bullock. Sandra Bullock was in it. I'll, oh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll look it up. But it was a really strange, like, I was watching this movie, and I'm like, they're trying to say something here, but I don't really know what it is. Um, but it was a very bizarre movie. I'll, I'll figure out what, what, it, what, it's, what it's called. But it, Was that the one where they had to be blindfolded all the time? Maybe that's it. Yeah, let me uh, let me look yeah. let me look up Sandra Bullock's recent films. But it was very bizarre. But yeah, I'm always watching these movies. Like, okay, what are they trying to say here? What what what, what messages are they trying to get across? Um, sure. Somebody just brought up Terry Gilliam's Brazil. Yes. Yeah. Meg Meg brought which that. Which is which a is great film. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some, uh, so, was, go ahead. You still have Deepthi's comment up. Oh, what I can say? yeah, I can. Uh, yeah, hold on, I'll bring, up, I can bring it up. Hold on. There we go. What was that? People in India only consider slumber because it came from the West. You can just make them slumber in yet another term. Sure, criticism is spoke to only framing within which the global north can process the global south in its framing. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I agree. So I'm looking up the Sandra Bullock film that was that came out. But I mean, it, what would be interesting to, to do is to start to map this out. It would be kind of a fun project to like yeah. be, co be consciously pay attention to like not just the narrative, not the not just the plot, but what's the what's the you know what you call the the, the sub uh, subtext. The what's the sub What's the subplot? Yeah. What you know. Uh, and in the yeah. last conversation we talked, I, I brought up the movie Pursuit of Happiness, which I just find the yeah. fasc fascinating movie. It's a Will Smith movie, if anybody's seen this. And the, the the story is this guy is like basically sacrificing everything and, you know, really being a shitty father and a shitty husband, but he's doing it for the betterment of the family. So he's working, you know, long hours trying to sell uh, this. I, I can't remember. It's some medical medical machine that he goes, he's a salesman and, and he's like, loses his wife, his kids pissed off at him. But then at the end he makes money. 
And then they all come back to him and they love him. And it's, it's, it's a happy story, but it's a really brilliant movie because it's, it's really sophisticated and really well done propaganda. If you, if you, you know, cause it sucks you in, you're like, Oh yeah, this guy, you know, he just cares. But that narrative of like, what's the underlying narrative of that? Like, if you just work hard, if you just try hard enough, you'll make it, you will make it. You know, if you just keep buying those lottery tickets, now that's not a fair example. Obviously you have a better chance of making it from selling you know, medical devices, I'm sure, than winning the lottery. But but still, I mean, there is there is something about this economic system that already predetermines that you're going to have a certain number of losers. I don't care how much, if everybody, I, I was mentioning to a friend of mine who's kind of a believer in a lot of the narrative, um, you know, about, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps and you can make it. And I said, you know, if everybody did exactly what you what you say, uh, it would be horrible for the people. You know, the people. You know, th there'd be massive competition for this small amount of of stuff. I mean, you should be grateful that <laughs> that's, that not not everybody's doing what you're what you're advocating that they do because you'd be in big trouble. You know. Um, but anyway, comments. Well, yeah, I mean, in India, there it is like that. You know, like the the population is. The system is structured in a way where overly competitive thinking is the only way out. There is no other way out. You have to, you have to, there is no state welfare that, I mean, there's not much anyway. Like there's some subsidies for farmers and uh, there's some clinics which will give you medication and education, things like this. But generally, if you're in the job market, it's, it's absolutely horrifying. Everybody is in, and that, and in cinema, so, I mean, the common man becomes the savior, you know, like in cinema in India, this, that's the dream, is that, that the, the common man makes it, the poor common man becomes the rich, powerful person. Incidentally, there was a film which was called Shri Charso Bis, Shri Mr. 420. And so, in the, in the, in the Indian penal code, the number 420 is representing cheating and fraud. So there is the story of a man who goes to Bombay and he lives on the streets in the slums with the, with the locals, but then eventually makes some deals that make him very rich and he falls in love with this woman and then he loses all of it and comes back on ground. You know? So it's a very interesting story to watch. So Vija says, uh, check out the, the book, The Circle by Dave Eggers. Uh, there's a movie as well that's suggesting yeah. that one. I'm not familiar with that one, Vija. Um, also, um, the, the, the film was called Bird Box, the, the Sandra Bullock film. It's called Bird okay. Box. Yeah. Very, very bizarre. Uh, but there, yeah, yeah. anyways. Uh, I'm looking here uh, at the uh, comments. On YouTube, uh, Roma, Twitter. yeah, Roma says uh, the self help in <clears throat> the self help industry was uh, built around that narrative, and I'm not sure which comment she was referring to because I'm I'm a little behind on reading the comments. Sorry, guys. Maybe she can write a new one right now. Yeah. Well, the self. I mean, that narrative is very interesting to watch, like the self help narrative, because. See, I mean, I think right now we live in this kind of hyper real situation where our life is built on obsolescence entirely. And we have this added persona, which is the public face. So we're really kind of far away from, from authentic, maybe authenticity. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's just like kind of a distance that we have to track back a little bit from those ideas. Yeah. Um, so how do we get, how do we get back <laughs> to a, to being more authentic, ha having the, our thoughts, our words, and our, our, our actions cut from the same cloth. But do we tend to believe more what we see in the media generally? I think that's what we were addressing, right? Like that, that it's, well, that, what's that, weird that, is that there's... especially fiction. The strange thing is, like, even within their people's belief, I think there's a duality because, like, people will act, you know, they'll go and vote for the guy, even though they know he's, like, 
actively working against them. Because if you have a conversation with them, and if you know, if you dig a little bit, you'll you'll get them to admit, yeah, they're lying to me, you know, whatever. Yet they're not yeah. acting. Yeah. They're not acting on that. Like, okay, they're lying to you now. Why doesn't that affect? Why is that affecting your behavior? Like, you know, like what you're you're still playing the game, and you know, and, and so I don't know what the answer to that is, but it seems like even within within that, there's there's a a, a binary. I think it's largely conflict. like unless I mean I can take care it, as long as I can I can if my life with its struggles and pushes and pulls. I can still manage it. I don't need to question the narrative. If it starts tearing my life apart is the only time then I start looking at it. I think that's the place we are at right now, generally, at least in metropolitan contexts, where, which are industrialized and not so much indigenous contexts where relationships are built differently within each other and with the environment, with nature. In, I think in industrial context, it's more that I have to take care of myself and my life and as long as even with all of this un the, the undecided nature of who is lying to me and who is not, I even know it. But as long as I can get by and as, as long as I can keep my lifestyle intact, I'll still do, keep doing whatever it is. It's habits, right? Like the habits are difficult to break because those habits are, yeah, I think that those habits are really difficult to break. I think it's a habitual way of living. As long as my life doesn't fall apart, I don't need to change anything. Roma just chimed in. It was just that was about pulling yourself up from the bootstraps. That was what her comment was uh, in re reference to. Okay. So, um, I mean, it would be. Uh, I, I would encourage like people that are watching this, and maybe like can send me. Uh, ideas about that because i would like to explore this more and maybe do uh, other shows on like dissecting the 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 narratives that are being pushed and even going a step further of like okay what what company produced this particular film because you will see certain you know certain producers and certain companies putting out a uh, a lot of material that that has those narratives and that's where you can kind of figure out that there's a propaganda going on there there's a campaign it's not just you know but people go to the movie it's just entertainment it's just a movie you know but it's not just a movie it's not just entertainment it's part of pushing no. a it's part of pushing a narrative um but uh man i've i've, I've enjoyed I mean, this conversation. go ahead no i was just saying it's the visual and the textual narrative that's created within which then we start existing and so we'll, we believe that that is the world and we can't I mean in that sense like the imagination is imperialized there is no way or no place and time to have a constructive moment of what the alternative might be or can be you know like that imagination is missing now so it's become this spectacular self-referential self society, industrial society, which has no exits. So do you have, um, do you have thoughts on how, how to, you know, how to push back or break free from that? I mean, obviously to me, it would just be the first step obviously is to sh shut it off, you know, but like, how do you get people to do that? Like, don't go to that movie or don't, you know, listen to that politician or yeah. you know it's like garbage in garbage out but well in like I mean, one thing that's that has been kind of coming up again and again is that so let's say that the corporations are very selfish the politicians are all corrupt and the PC is a marriage between these two which is essentially doing whatever it wants right now what does the world look like without that? I mean, if we had to access it from a like a public facing perspective, what does the world look like with the absence of those things? What does the individual look like in a society where there is no need for justice system and policing? That I think is a good question to start asking now is to what to what extent can society evolve actually now? outside like beyond the need for out external authority to 
command it? What does it what is what is it going to take for the individual in society to to be able to command that? I think that's yeah, that's that's the thought. I agree and also like recognizing and I think some people are starting to do this that recognizing that they're giving us the solutions to the problems that they're creating that are not real solutions. And I, I think a lot about like the defund the police thing. So like my, my knee jerk immediate reaction is like, yeah, let's, yeah, we don't, you know, the police aren't actually helping us, you know, they're, they're not making the world a better place, but you know, then you dig deeper and you realize that there's actually an ulterior, like, you know, like, well, wait a minute, why are these politicians and why is the mainstream media promoting this narrative? What's that about, yeah. you know? So then you're like, okay, there's something else going on. Or even the protests, you know, um, Black Lives Matter is, you know, you know, one that's very divisive. It's interesting because I have people, friends who are like, Black Lives Matter is just a front group for Soros and it's just all this. Else. And then other people that are like, um, that are supportive of it. I, I think it's a complicated thing because it's, the, the most of the people that are involved with it are, are are genuine and actually have legitimate grievances that need to be addressed. And in addition to that, there's also manipulation of it that's happening with other purposes in mind. And so, but people don't have this ability to understand that like both things are actually true. Like both things are happening. You know, it's like, are you for or against it? You can't, you can't answer like the question like that. You know, that's not a, it's, it's, it's a removal of, of the dynamic nature of the pro of the, of the issue, you know, and it also yeah. like further helps to divide people, you know, and I, and I just see a lot of the thing that's going on is, is, uh, you know, these campaigns that, that are, that are, that are built around siloizing different movements and, and, and splitting people up and getting them fighting each other as opposed to, you know, the conversation I had today was about fighting things versus just accepting them. But, but like, I mean, how, how do you fight what's going on? Like, you can't really fight it. But we do have to, like, I think do, we do have to, like, remove ourselves from it, which which my friend pointed out is is a way of fighting it. So, I mean, his approach is a little bit different. His, his approach is just like, well, just figure out a way within the system to, to, to you know, make sure you don't get, you know, the wave you know go swimming under the wave but it's also very individualized and uh the and that, so that raises the question am i responsible for anybody else or am i just responsible for myself or you know especially you know with with a lot of this like you're trying to raise the alarm to people who don't even want to listen to you and you're like you don't even understand like there's some shit about to go down and you're not even seeing it and i'm you know i'm sitting there trying to like raise the alarm to people who don't even want to hear it and you know i don't i don't know what the answer is but it's 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 pretty nutty like <laughs> well I mean, maybe very quickly we can look at it that um ultimately is the power structure for right now? What is it doing? It does, we can say, I mean, maybe you tell me what you think about this, but the, the, the war for resources, which was already foreseen by the powers that be in the early 90s, has, has been on for about 10, 15 years now. And the big boys are playing with each other fighting with each other, trying to gain control of all of this natural and human resource everywhere in the world. But what does the resource satisfy? Why do they want it? What is it going to do for them? I think it's only, I mean, I'll bring it back, is that it's only for the public consumption, right? Like they, they are creating, they're manufacturing so that then they can sell it to the public and then make all the money. So on both sides, they own the resource, they own the jobs. And so we have to go get a job so that we can have the money so that we can buy the resources that they own. It's, uh, it's quite a messy system. But I think at the center of it, it's us, right? Like, and the longer we fight with each other, the, the longer this is going to last. I mean, the ultimate question is also like how do we really want to stop the violence and destruction? Do we really want to stop it? And if we do, then how can we look at the world in a different way? And look at people in a different way, maybe. 
Well, is that the homework we have? (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. All right, kids. Now, uh, when you come back to class, I want you to figure out how to how we're going to solve this, and uh, we'll grade you on how well you did. Um, You know, I believe in people, and I think that um, you know whatever happens, uh, you know, I do believe that humanity will will rise to the occasion. Um, But I think it's also going to be damn messy along the way and i do think that like what what we're facing right now is is unprecedented uh i don't think that uh that humanity's ever experienced anything at least in in our recorded history uh like what is about to come online and so it's hard to wrap hard for people to wrap their minds around it i even with i, I sharing st- uh, the work of Allison and the work of Corey uh, Morningstar, I'm like, you have to sit with it a little bit because it doesn't, you know, you're not going to immediately, immediately cause it's, you know, it doesn't like fit right into your normal, like understanding of things. And, and you have to really like sit on like what the, what, what, what this is going to look like. And they tell you what they're going to do, you know, but it's hard to like, you don't have any like historical thing that you can like, Oh, it's kind of like when this happened. And I hear people like say that all the time, like, well, they've always been corrupt or this, this has always been happening. I'm like, no, no, you don't understand. Like what this, this fourth industrial revolution is like nothing before in human history. It's, it's, it's a, it's a reshaping. This is as big as like, you know, just this, the, the discovery of like, you know, or they're, they're, you know, starting to use gold or like, or this, I, I would argue that this is, as, as, is maybe as big as like the agricultural, you know, like revolution of, you know, where they, they started to, you know, the, the shift from, from like, you know, hunter gatherer to, you know what I mean? Like this is, it's, it's that big and, and you can read about it. It's not, this isn't just like somebody making shit up, like theoretical. Well, I think they might be doing this and whatever. It's like, no, you can actually read what their plans are. And it's, it's, it's hard to imagine how that's going to affect humanity and, and our relations with one another and our relations to pl- the planet or ecology and other life. But it's, it's pretty massive. And, and I don't know where I'm going with that, but people need to meet, really need to pay attention, I guess, is what I'm saying. No, but there what, are people. What, what you say? What you're saying is that, I mean, the filters that negotiate our individual relationships with each other and our collective relationship with nature are being fructified and it's not in our control. That's what is happening. You know, like somebody, there is going to be an agency that is going to now fully command those things. That, I think, is very dangerous. It's a very scary prospect that I'm like those filters already exist in some ways. They're movable, you know, like it might be race, religion, politics, whatever. Those filters are already there. But now they're being fructified in a, in a very homogenized prison like way, which is not in our control anymore, right? Like it's going to be in, in the control of artificial intelligence, which is being run by corporations or whatever it is. But it's just that is a scary prospect. It's a very scary prospect for me. And back to our original discussion about perception, I mean, the ability to micromanage people's perceptions, because before it was like, you know, you'd see the picture of everybody on the subway reading the same newspaper and you're like, wow, everybody's like basically getting the same information. Well, now with with AI and, you know, with the the technology, they can customize your your worldview, your perception. They can you can have your own unique perception that and this person can have their own unique perception and they're both wrong and and you kind of yeah. see that with people that are like you see that a little bit now with like the people that are glued to the democratic party side of things or people that are glued to the the dem the, the trump or the republican side of things and they have completely different understandings of the world and they're actually both if you if you look at them they're they're both off actually and yeah. but yeah. but but you can you can if thinking about you know this whole situation from the point of view of a controller and so like you can you know you can craft the whatever avatar you want and whatever worldview yeah. you want and we're just going to feed that you know we're not even gonna, we're going to we're just going to feed that and then you know and, and it's just going to get all these you know groups that are like splintered off and fighting against one another meanwhile like none of them have power and i argue with my friends too that that are like 
uh, really, uh, you know, uh, activists around racism. And they, 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 a lot of times they'll end up channeling their energy into some redneck, like some broke, dumbass redneck. And I'm like, sure. look, this guy, like, yeah, he's ignorant and he's driving around in his pickup truck or whatever with, you know, at the end of the day, he's still not your problem. He, he's still like a, he's cannon fodder. He's not really, he doesn't really have the, he's, he's not really holding power and he's just being used oh. and it's and to to channel your energy into that is actually serving what you really need to be focusing on but the media loves doing that like you know look at look at these yeah. guys and i'm not defending them by by any stretch of the imagination because it's there's some really f fucked up beliefs out there but um oh. but just seeing that as as in terms of um the what, what there was a term and i somebody can remember it, the Horlitzer, you know, you know, the phrase, you know, using that we can play people like a Horlitzer that, which is a, a, yeah. a keyboard, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. you know, and that's, there's, yeah. that's existed, but the ability is like, it's, there's, it's totally new. They're, they're the capacity for it. Yeah. To tailor make your super ego on the social media platforms is so easy. I mean, Instagram is a great example. And I mean, when you reflect that off the neuroses of mainstream lead characters in these supremely manipulative and violent series that are all over these streaming platforms, it's amazing. You know, like then you have, I mean, there are a few things which are very prominent. One is that this absolutely violent and manipulative way of living which is present in these series and then you have instagram which is this total projection where people are literally alone in their houses talking to cameras now that's what they're doing like it's, they're just looking at cameras and smiling at cameras it's just that makes me laugh you know like it's just a, it's how isolated you have to be to be able to do that like what i mean there's no immediate feedback no like so then right now you're just like smiling at a camera like taking selfies this is that for me is quite scary that is quite a scary thing so well and but they'll be able to get it to where it it, it, it is interacting with you and you know what they they say yeah. that you know in the future it's going to be very difficult for people to tell the difference between what's real and what's artificial and especially people that are young you know growing you know people that are going to grow into this this whole world who never had that other experience to to compare it with i mean what's what kind of effect is that going to have i mean it's it's really shocking, you know, and, and it, again, I can't understand why more people are not, um, you know, even just questioning this, you know, it's kind of, kind of incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So Jean Baudrillard has written this simulations and simulacra book. Oh, this yeah. short read. But it, I mean, I think we are there. Like that's the, the situation this critique was about this hyper reality and real, very real illusion that has been created by industrial society, which is self referential. And it, there is no more connection to reality anymore. It's just delusional. It's just all these super highly indulgent neurotic delusions that we are getting sucked into. So you continuously, like there, this veneer, the film, the screen, no longer relates to a real life event. It's just a self-referential thing. And that's the only thing that you're continuously interacting with. And that is, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, I mean, if that's not a prison, I don't know what is. Like, if that's a, like a cognitive, mental, emotional prison, I don't know what, what is really. But I yeah. think, yeah, we are at that point. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, I think we had a pretty good, good discussion here and i like i said uh varun and i had a discussion the other day that that i recorded as well so i might make like a little supplemental with some of that footage and and keep this conversation going and and particularly like those of you who are watching um you know if, if you have if you see anything interesting in pop culture or in movies that particularly relate to what what you know i know a lot of people that are watching are aware of what's happening with the the great reset and the you know um uh, fourth industrial revolution and what's what the world economic form is putting forward uh 
I would I would love to like do more on that and start to dissect some of that stuff and actually like look at some of the the production companies and those people who were actually producing this material I think would be an interesting thing. And on the flip side actually, you know, you can't just I I'm I'm guilty of, you know, being Debbie Downer or whatever, just focusing on like everything that's wrong. Um, but spending a little bit more time too on looking on what's right, you know, what, you know, what films and what, what media and what's out there that's actually pushing a, a different narrative. And, and uh, I think that's valuable as well. So I think I'd love to continue this conversation. Maybe it can be like a subsect of, if we were honest, like the arts and entertainment section or whatever. So, but uh, yeah. Thank you, Varun. I appreciate you joining me, and thank you, everyone that's that's been uh, listening. And uh, Roma, we, we need your essay definitely tomorrow morning. And uh, the rest, rest of you, we will we will be grading on a sliding scale, so don't worry. Um, so, uh, anyways, I appreciate you all, and uh, till next time. Thanks. Thanks.